don't know about it. I'm going to talk about something tonight. It's a little kind of obvious uh, to me uh, that I didn't talk about it yet. And it's uh, classification. So when you go to, to any jail or prison in this country, it doesn't matter where it's at or, or what city or state or county, federal, whatever it may be that you're in, um, there's certainly going to be a process to kind of adjust my light here and get it better. So um, you have a process, though, where they're going to look at you as a person. They're going to look at what they can pull from your records, whatever they may be, whether it's nothing or whether it's an actual pretty severe criminal record. Um, and they're going to make a decision about what housing unit within that facility to put you in. That's important because, you know, if, if, you, if you're there for, you know, I'm not condoning DUI. It's certainly a serious crime to, to me and anybody that, that's on the road with you uh, or in your car for that matter as well. But uh, DUI, you, it's, a, it's a pretty common offense. It's something that, that a lot of people have done. And there isn't really a severe penalty for doing it, it typically. Um, or jaywalking. I don't know if anyone's been arrested in, in the last 20 years for jaywalking. Probably has. Um, or other. That's the point, though, is other minor type charges. Um, you're not typically going to be in the same unit as someone that, that uh, say, unit, the same housing area or cell block or uh, dorm or whatever, this, the, however your facility may be. You're not going to be in the same dorm or area as someone that, that is a serial killer, uh, for instance. Um, you could be. You could walk past them. You could be in the same the same, the same same wing, but maybe a different section. So it just depends. But um, it was my experience in Kentucky's prison system that the classification system overall, uh, minus some issues that I'm going to talk about here in a minute, but <clears throat> overall was pretty pretty accurate, pretty fair, and, and pretty reliable, um, minus the exceptions that I'm going to talk about, and, the, and, the, and they're pretty glaring exceptions, honestly. Um, so unit staff at any jail or prison, they have a, a uh, process they go through. They look at your criminal history or whatever it may be, whether it's significant, not so significant. They look at your char the charge that you're in there for now accused of, if it's a jail, um, or a conviction if you're in prison, obviously. Um, they look at your, your what's in Kentucky and other places, I'm sure it's called your crime story. Um, things like your pre-sentence investigation report, which is typically prepared in most jurisdictions. And basically it's an examination by the court into uh, your past, your, your family and social past, the things you were doing before you were arrested or charged. Um, what kind of job you had, what kind of education you had, what your family life was like if you were married, um, whether your mom and dad are still alive. Um, they talk to them um, sometimes as part of that process and other people. They're, they're, they're trying to get uh, the purpose of their pre-sentence report, pre-sentence investigation report is to take that information to the judge and, you know, let them know uh, what the probation and paroles uh, recommendation to the judges in regard to sentencing and it's something that's prepared you can waive that but doesn't always have to happen so um, and there's different implications if you do waive that report and it's something that you can talk to your lawyer about if you are arrested or sentenced um, in anticipation of that sentencing hearing is waiving that or not and what's your best option to that would be but um, depends to some people it can it can be in uh, an advantage or a benefit to waive that reading of that report. Um, but you need to be careful because there may be some uh, factual information in that report that may be wrong. Courts do get it wrong. Uh, certainly the uh, agents of the court can get it wrong as well. So um, that's a decision you have to make You know when that time comes. But they take that information, other things like that, and they make a decision uh, usually at uh, whether it's a, a jail environment, you know, um, or when you get to prison, your first receiving prison, your diagnostic prison in your state is also going to make a recommendation and do some examinations, whether it's medical, physical, those kinds of things. And they all factor into it, certainly. Uh, if you have diabetes or if you have mental health issues, um, if you have schizophrenia, uh, things like that, then you're certainly going to need to have different levels of care at one facility than you need to have at another. So um, that's going to be considered into all that, hopefully. But the thing that I'll say is that 
when it comes to actually issuing a classification decision, <laughs> the investigative process that they use, whoever it may be, and the, the questions they may ask you, a lot of times they're going to ask you questions to see kind of where your state of mind is, or you want to hurt yourself, or you want any long-term medications that may have, you know, certain side effects, um, antipsychotics or, or things like that. Um, that's going to be included into that. And they're going to make a decision. They're going to make a, a housing decision, but also a threat level effectively um, or a custody level because of the threat you may pose to the community. It, it's, it's misleading because in a lot of places, they'll have a tiered type system. So it may be something that reads, and I'm taking Kentucky's wording, um, but you can apply this to other places as well. But you'll have something to the effect of community, minimum, medium, close or maximum uh, and those are all security levels so at each at each security levels and it's defined in the policies in Kentucky and the corrections policies and also in parts of the statutes that your you know your custody level your threat level um, decides what type of facility you can be at where if you're community custody you could be an inmate at a place like a halfway house which is decidedly in the community um, you can go out to work every day. You can come back. You have to come back, obviously. It's not a thing. If you can come back, you have to come back every day. If you don't, then you've escaped, effectively. Um, you're still held to the same rules as any other inmate in any other institution throughout the state. <laughs> but you're just allowed certain freedoms. Uh, minimum, uh, that was the lowest I was able to get down to as far as my custody level. Uh, probably could have gotten that down further, but due to some issues that were they were at that facility that I was at. I decided not to. Um, but when I was on parole, when I was released to the halfway house, then I was certainly community custody for all intents and purposes because I was in the community. Uh, parolee versus inmate is a different kind of setup there, but you get the point. So um, it's it's something that as you, and I'll tell you, a lot of times your crime is going to dictate what type of security or housing unit you're going to be in. <laughs> so if you're sent to prison for a registration uh, or stolen license plate, something, you know, nonviolent, relatively small, uh, drug possession, things like that, unless it's your 45th offense, then you're going to be typically um, judged to be a not really a big threat to the community and your security level isn't going to need to really be that high. So, you know, there's a lot of advantages to minimum or community over medium or close or maximum or level one, two, three, or four, whatever, however your state or place may decide that, you know, your custody level is. Um, certainly if you see the parole board from a lower level of custody, the thought is, and this doesn't always carry weight, but it is kind of a, a good thought process that, well, I'm already in the community or I'm already, I'm in a place where there's no gun towers. There's no, you know, there's no armed guards. There's no roving patrols to keep me here. The only thing keeping me here is my own volition and will to stay here and finish my sentence out and do well. Um, and the fact that I haven't escaped, you know, the parole board should consider that. And they, and they may, but honestly, there's people that, that are, you know, very close to parole and they still run away from those kinds of places. So, um, and you're still an inmate. That's the thing that people tend to lose sight of, especially <laughs> in lower level security places is that you're still an inmate. You may be minimum security, but you're still a state inmate. Uh, or a county inmate or a, a city inmate, however it may be, you're still under sentence or you're still accused of a crime. So it um, doesn't really matter where your housing unit is. You're just locked up, more or less. Um, but the the more restrictive type of environment that you're in, there's a lot of research, I think, that shows that that can have an effect on you as a person. Um, different tempo and environments of these places uh, you know, a place like Soledad in California or ADX, which is a federal supermax uh, administrative segregation in Colorado. Um, you know, it's certainly a place that has a, a, a lethal a death row or a lethal injection type component to the facility is going to be more restrictive a lot of times than, than your minimum security uh, work camp or halfway house, something like that. So there's an advantage to you as an inmate to get your security level down. Now, the state has guidelines about, you know, how far down that can actually go. And that was the issue that I, that I ran into with, uh, with my case and my situation, the time that I was in prison. So 
<clears throat> from the time that I was placed into custody, I was given, uh, you know, on a uh, through the matrix that that the state of Kentucky uses, I was given basically three points. So that's three out of a possible X. I'm not sure what the maximum number of points that an inmate can have. I never received anywhere close to that. The most that I received was uh, seven or ten, I think. Um, can't remember the exact number, but it wasn't enough to be sent back to medium security. <clears throat> um, but what happened was when I went to prison at first, I was everybody that goes from a county jail to a prison, you're you're provisional, you're you're not classified yet, so there really isn't everyone has the same custody level effectively. <laughs> So you go to the diagnostic prison in Kentucky, which is at Rotor Correctional Complex in LaGrange. You're given your initial classification and custody score. And then from there, you go to whatever facility or, you know, in the state that has a bed open and, and you're, you're sent there to be a permanent resident for this length of your sentence, whatever it may be, for that period of time. So the first place that I went to after the diagnostic prison was uh, Green River Correctional Complex in Western Kentucky. <clears throat> when I was at Green River, the thing, the thing that happened at Rotor was that they gave me three points for different things, the severity of the crime, those kinds of things, um, criminal history, et cetera. Um, they also put an override, which means that because my point score, my number point score was below a certain level, and because of the situation, it, it would have been, in their mind, I guess, disproportionate to immediately put me into a... a uh, medium or minimum security type environment. They put the override to where I'd have to go to medium security. So the first time I came for parole, I really tried to get that security level down with the thinking that if I'm in the community already, then that may be more inclination for the parole board to let me out, give me a chance of parole. Didn't work out that way. <laughs> so when I was denied parole, I really began working on trying to get my security level down and to get the override taken off, which in Kentucky, and that you know, because of that, was something that was only uh, able to be done by uh, uh, basically a decision from people in Frankfurt, the state capital, where the corrections uh, headquarters is at. So, went through the process, administrative appeal process, and was able to get that override eventually removed um, due to, I guess, the people in Frankfurt seeing my points that I made in the the letter that I wrote to them. So I was transferred from Green River to a minimum security place, which minimum security, there is a lot of advantages to being there. The thing is, is that when it comes down to it, you're still in prison. It's not like you go from medium security of gun towers or roving patrols and armed guards keeping you in there to, you know, nothing. And you can just do what you want. And it's not that way. You're still a state inmate. You still have all those rules that apply. You still get the same food pretty much. And you're still locked up. You can't go and see your family as you want to. You can't do a lot of the things, you know, that you may think you can do, because in the end, you're you're you have a lower security level or custody level, but you're still locked up. Doesn't change that. So, that's the problem with that. But in the end, it it. On the whole, the, the environment in a, in a minimum security or decreased custody level is better. And that's the same way if you're in a halfway house. It's still the same the same way that it's better that you're at a place like that versus medium security. Now, there's exceptions to that, and that's the problem, is that some people actually like the structure of being at, a, a, I guess for lack of a better phrase, a real prison. I didn't really like that. I, you know, I was closer to going home. I needed to kind of get back into society, into being around, I guess, more people, and to have the ability to go in the community. At the minimum security place that I went to at, at Blackburn, I was able to do a lot of different things. I was able to uh, certainly be closer to home um, than, you know, the place that I was before in the western part of the state, came closer to, to Louisville, where I'm from. So, uh, that's one advantage that can help. Uh, you're also closer, so phone calls typically are going to be a lot cheaper. Um, the other things that are less tangible, I guess, is that those minimum security places typically offer more programs and things you can do because <laughs> they usually have a lower amount of people. Uh, I think Green River had an excess of a thousand. Blackburn never had more than six hundred. 
uh, my memory serves correct. So less people, the same amount of programs, you're going to have more of a chance to get into multiple programs and to get your, your time down to do different things, to get some experience and some skills that may help you. So that's certainly an advantage. Um, overall, the classification process is something that you can, you can contest it if you disagree with it. That's something you have to go through. They make decisions about you and your character and, and where you're best to be served, to be housed at, based on the factors they have available to them. And they're not really going to listen terribly to a whole lot you have to say when it comes down to it. I hate to be that way, but that's pretty much the way it is, unless they're made to do that. And sometimes that needs to happen. So, um, But, you know, getting classified or... or you know the reception process of it, and that and the thing is, is that happens multiple. It isn't just one time that you get classified or, or you know, classification occurs. It's several times throughout the time that you're going to be in prison. That's going to happen. Whether it's you have a, a disciplinary report, if you get uh, fired from a job in prison, that's going to happen again, and your point score may change. Um, if you have good time that's given back to you or taken away from you, that's going to change. Um, if you have overrides removed, that's going to change. So there's other, other events that can happen. If you get a new warrant, new charge, new detainer, those kinds of things, then you're going to be reclassified. So classification basically is an administrative process where the prison looks at you and decides what the best security level or housing level for you to be at, You know whether that's minimum security or maximum security, or anywhere in between. So if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below, and I will definitely get back to them. And thank you all, and be careful. Take care of each other.